We are live. Welcome to Review and Thoughts, 1975's French Connection 2. So, I thought this movie was good. I can understand why some people think it's great. I can understand why some people think it's trash. And, yeah, the movie will have a few jokes, and I will get into some serious subjects. So, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. And, let's see. The... Yeah, so, the movie is rated R, and so is this video. I might swear, and I will discuss some of the messed up stuff in the movie. Whether you love or hate the these two movies, or the rest of the franchise, I guess, you know, I don't hate you. I like both of these movies, and I can understand why some people love them. But I can also understand why some people hate them, and I do definitely take issue with the politics. So, let's see. The... That brings us... Yes, so, I streamed this and thus didn't pay any extra money to watch it. So anything negative I say in this video is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like somebody... I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to the first movie, my expectations, the trailer. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this are fair criticisms based on budget when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. So... Yeah, the, this is my first viewing, and between the movie finishing and me recording this video, very little time has passed, so it is fresh in my memory. So, the plot, Popeye Doyle travels to Marseille to find Alain Charnier, the drug smuggler who eluded him in New York. And... Yeah, according to IMDb trivia, this is the first movie in Hollywood history to have a title and just two after it. The Godfather Part 2 was the first sequel to have a number in it, but that was preceded by Part. French Connection was the first to have the title and just a number after it. And... Let's see... Yeah, the, a practice that is now commonplace. The original title and then a numeral after it for... A sequel title. So yeah, I did this movie because I thought, you know, I saw it on Disney Plus. I thought it might be interesting to talk about, and I'm glad I did. I remembered hearing about there being two French Connection movies years and years ago. I did not remember that apparently very few people care about the second one. I'm not even talking about that it's not as well liked. This has very few reviews, at least on the sites that I check. You know, IMDb, including its external reviews section, you know, Metacritic, Rotten Tomatoes, there's really not very much on this, which I don't think it deserves to be quite as ignored as... But I, I get it, you know, it's not... Like, the first one is iconic, you know. I don't... Again, I take issue with the politics, but I'm not, you know... Yeah, I, I try not to, you know, it, it is a movie that everyone, you know, it changed things. It It's, yeah. And this one really, it doesn't, and I don't really think it's trying to. I think they just wanted to, I, I would not say that this is a movie made by people who didn't care about making a good movie. Some sequels are, for sure. But I do think that they they had a vision here. I don't know, I mean, maybe it's sort of a respectful thing. Maybe they kind of didn't think that it was right to do a sequel to such an iconic movie and try to outdo it in iconicness, so they just tried to make an enjoyable movie 
that featured some of the same characters and, you know, furthered the story. So, I think I'm not going to spend forever talking about police reform, police abolition. I think the, the Thought Slimes video, All Cops Are Bad, and I forget what video, what the video title is, but Non-Compete also did a, a great video talking about what, you know, what should police be replaced by and arguing why they should be replaced. And yeah, so I'm going to quote a few things that Thought Slime says in his video, All Cops Are Bad. The problem isn't with individual cops, it's policing as an institution. You should abolish the police, replace them with something more egalitarian. Currently, the police are very resistant to having their behavior scrutinized. Their actions make it very clear that they want to get away with extrajudicial violence. The police protect the rich, not the poor. The system isn't broken. It is made to keep the powerful in control. The police should be abolished and replaced by voluntary community self-defense. We should focus on punishment, not on punishment, but on restitution and rehabilitation. We should prevent crimes instead of punishing them. Not obviously not like pre-crime, like minority port. The excellent short story and the eh, could do worse movie. Now, let's see. Yeah, so a lot of Americans hate French people. That by itself is not wrong. I'm not telling you not to hate people that you think deserve to be hated, unless they're members of a minority. But a lot of modern Americans don't really think about why they hate the French. They've just always hated the French because everyone around them hates the French. I've heard a couple of different reasons, so I will briefly go over them. They're arrogant. No more than Americans are. And keep in mind, they went for democracy before America did. They literally inspired a lot of other countries to change the way the country is wrong. That's run. That's something to be proud of. Some people hate the French because they refuse to go along with the invasion of Iraq, which is down to them actually looking at the lack of evidence, how badly reasoned that invasion was. And one of the really big ones is that a number of Americans hate the French because of World War II, calling them cowards, which is ridiculous, considering all the French resistance members, and saying that they're ungrateful for being rescued by America. The American military bombed French towns and cities when all they had to do was wait out the Germans that they had already surrounded. Wait until they run out of food and they will surrender. You don't have to destroy French buildings to do it. And you cannot for one second convince me that Americans would not be furious if another country destroyed some of their buildings and called it helping. And yes, de Gaulle did take credit. So hate him, hate the person, not the people. How would you feel if the people of an entire country hated you because of what one of your leaders once did? You know, so many years after, like, I get it hating, hating them at the time, especially, you know, yeah. Anyway, so the writing. The, this was written by Alexander Jacobs, R.I.P. Robert Dillon, Laurie Dillon, Pete Hamill, R.I.P. And Laurie Dillon also, R.I.P. So, yeah, this, uh, it's not usually a good thing to have four writers on the same script. Now, Alexander Jacobs wrote six movies in total. I have to admit, I don't know any of them, but it seems like they're similar to this one. And he wrote one episode of Cannonball, and he produced... Yeah. Robert Dillon wrote, or has written 15 movies. He's still alive. And, yeah, again, it seems like other somewhat similar to this one... And then some that are not like this one, like X, the the man with X-ray eyes, Bikini Beach, yeah. And Laurie Dillon has no other IMDb credits, but I'm guessing she and Robert Dillon probably wrote together. I believe they're, they were married at the time. Now, and Pete Hamill wrote, has 10 TV writing credits, and, let's see, five, 
um, movie writing credits. Though, let's see. Yeah, the the screenplay does a good job of like for most of the movie very little time will pass without some kind of plot progression and it's not as like a ch part of this movie is that Popeye does not know the streets of Marseille the way he knew the streets of New York so he's out of his element and yeah some of the movies just devoted to him going around trying to you know some of the time yeah trying to do police work trying to get with young women trying to have a drink and struggling because of the language barrier and such but the movie does not you know I yeah, I'm, I'm not going to say exactly how frequent, but v very, the movie never lets very long, rarely lets very long pass with absolutely no plot progression. And yeah, the, the characters are fairly credible. I think that might be more or less... Yeah, so that brings us to the direction. This was directed by John Frankenheimer, RIP. I don't know how, but I keep watching the movies by him that aren't... the Like, if you talk to a John Frankenheimer completist, he will tell you, dude made some of the best movies ever. Okay, so there are a handful of them that are just good not amazing but as long as you watch the other ones i yeah i don't know how i keep so other than this i watched reindeer games ronin let's see manchurian oh right manchurian candidate is amazing but other than that the movies of his that i've watched are the ones that yeah so i guess i will just very briefly Reindeer Games is a 6. Ronin is a 7. Manchurian Candidate is an 8. Did I not watch the whole crook? Okay, I'm just... I am I swear I'm not going to spend forever, but I am almost certain I watched whole crook. Covenant. Yeah, that one is also a 6. So, yeah. I mean, if you're a big fan of Michael Caine, that's why my dad watched it, and... That's why I watched it, so yeah. Now, oh, right, and you don't have to tell me, I know that his The Island of Dr. Moreau is utterly terrible. Though, though some people say it's, it's fun to watch as just a train wreck. Now, let's see. I would like to watch some of his, you know, yeah, at, at some point, if I keep watching his movies, at some point, I'm going to hit on more than one of the, the really great ones. I love his The Higher short. You can watch it for free legally here on YouTube. And in general, a lot of The Higher shorts are good, but his is probably my favorite. But yeah, the the movie there's there's this one chunk that's an exception, but other than that, the movie is quite fast paced, and the plot starts very early and keeps it moving very nicely. And like many action action sequels, the action gets bigger and it is well handled. I just briefly about the plot. I realize. See, I don't personally think it was a flaw of the first movie. I've seen others, other, other critics, disliked that the first movie basically it sets up two different plot threads. There's the the 
you know, Shonyi in Marseille working on drugs, drug smuggling, and then you have these New York cops, and for a while, like, it, it takes a little while before the first movie connects the two, right? I will be spoiling the entire first movie. I am not going to spoil this movie until I get into the thoughts section. And I will be putting up the spoiler tag up there when I... Yeah, otherwise I will warn before spoilers. Hold up an index finger. You can mutants skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. So, yeah, you know, this movie... You know, those two plot threads have been connected. The, yeah, basically, this movie, from the very start, Popeye is looking for Shonyi. And, yeah, there's not really any, I guess, maybe that's also part of why there's, I don't, I'm not saying there's a huge chunk of the movie devoted to just him struggling with the language and such. But I think an argument could be made that it's at least a little bit too much. It's it's more than needed to, and the movie's definitely longer than it needs to, considering that, like, we are basically just waiting for Popeye to catch up to Shanyi. You know, I mean, when the first movie did it, it was fresh. It was different. And I mean, to be fair, this movie doesn't do it in the exact same way. For a chunk of this, like... Basically, Popeye does not know where Shonyi is. He's looking for him in Marseille, where for a significant chunk of, like, almost the entirety of the, the, the first movie is actually Popeye, like, getting closer to Shonyi. You know, he, he finds some, you know, he, he finds... I actually forget, was the first guy he beat up particularly relevant, or was that just a way to show his methods? But anyway, you know, he finds out, okay, so these people are working on smuggling drugs into, you know, America, into New York. Yeah, through through the, yeah, internationally. So, you know, who, yeah, he, he gradually finds out who is behind it. And... We see the the ah, what's the uh, right on the tip of my tongue. Um, yeah, you know, gradually he discovers that Shanye is behind it, and then he's you know waiting to catch Shanye in the act. And in this, like, there's not really like most of the. Yeah, we're, we're just kind of... I honestly think what people really wanted out of this movie could be distilled into a short film. And if they gave, you know, like, if those were as high profile as big feature-length movies, I think there's some chance this would have just been a short film. Now... Like, yeah, hi, you know, let's say that this was, let's say that the first movie was an MCU movie, and after it was released, the studio realized, okay, some people really want something very specific out of this. They wouldn't have made a sequel. They would have made one of those, what do they call them again? One shot. They would have made a one shot release on a DVD or Blu-ray of maybe one of the less popular movies, so that they could, you know, ship some units like that. Or, you know, maybe eventually put it on Disney+, Plus and people would be fine with that. You know, we are not, it, you know, a lot of people love Baby Groot. We're not getting a feature-length Baby Groot movie. We got, you know, some shorts. I think well, maybe 15 minutes total, you know, if you don't count the end credits, and why would you? Yeah, this this did not need to be an entire movie, but they tried to think of some ways to make it interesting, and I think they largely succeeded. So, the first movie hates the French, and this one, even more so. It's, yeah. Now, the... 
yeah, the, the start of the movie does a good job setting up. Like, you immediately... You know, you, you, you grok immediately. Something big is going down. There's, there's something here. But it doesn't pay off on it until further down the line. You know, and Popeye arrives very early in the movie. And I do appreciate he almost immediately gets in touch with the cop that he was supposed to get in touch with, you know, considering how much of the movie is ultimately just him, you know, I wouldn't say aimlessly, but he doesn't, he's not as, not as, not as driven as in the first one, you know. So I am not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but if it's with what came before, I think the ending of the movie is good. I think the filmmakers probably wanted me to think it was great, and I can understand why some people might think it's great. There are there's no Deus Ex Machina, there's no convenient writing. Or no more convenient in the ending than um the rest of the movie up to that point. And Okay, so I'm gonna quote a few fellow critics here. The ending is absolutely perfect. It cuts at the exact right time and gives you what it should. So, like I said, some some people think it's perfect. Director Frankenheimer does his best to keep the film moving, and he succeeds admirably in the final act, but the 90 minutes of Drek that precede the finale are of little interest, perhaps even tainting one's enjoyment of the first film, which is something no sequel should ever do. The ending is the strongest part of the film, with its excellent use of the handheld to high grain POV shots, and the very last sequence before the credits is wonderfully edited. Pity the rest of the film couldn't be as tightly cut down as those 15 seconds. Yeah, this definitely could have been cut down like a tree so from the lumberjack. And the let's see. Right, that brings us to the characters. So, Gene Hackman returns as Detective Jimmy Popeye Doyle. And, let's see. Basically, you know, he's, he's very much the ugly American stereotype. Like, from right away, he refuses to, like, there's this, you know, there's this cop that is his contact in Marseille. And I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna try. Henri Barthélemy, and you know he pronounces it slightly off, so the French have difficulty understanding. You know, I, th I think he says Barthélemy or something. You know, and they're like, "What? You know, can, can you repeat that? Like, you know?" And one of them, when when they understand, oh, you mean. You know, then he says, but tell me. And instead of being mature and being like, oh, that's how you're supposed to pronounce it, Popeye, like a child, says, yeah, but tell me. You know, like, it's their language. Yeah. Why are you telling them how to pronounce their words in their language? It's just, yeah. So, you know, from from right away, it's just... <clears throat> he's a tourist. He doesn't know the language. His old methods don't work. He doesn't know the streets of Marseille like those of New York. Some viewers and critics love it. Others find it frustrating or sad. You know, for people who like Popeye and his methods, it's like seeing your idol humiliated. It's definitely different, you know, I I think it would have been uninteresting, perhaps profitable, but uninteresting to have another movie set in New York of Popeye, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe this time it isn't drugs, maybe it's some other, you know, uh, maybe it's 
human trafficking. Maybe there's a serial killer loose, you know, something. I'm sure it would have made money. I, I am 100% certain that people wanted more Popeye Doyle. But I, I'm not sure whose idea this was. Someone looked at it and said, we got to do something different with Popeye. Because, like, what are you going to do? Are you going to make a movie where he's, like, slowly coming apart and then at the end he does something horrible? That's kind of what the first movie is. You know, he gets increasingly angry and out of control and at the end he shoots another cop. You know, a good cop. Like, okay, the guy, you know, provoked him, said some things he didn't like, but he still shot a cop on his own side, you know, and, and didn't even flinch when he realized, you know, Another option would be to try to rehabilitate the character, like say, oh no, he's never done anything wrong, he is a hero through and through, and that would completely miss the point of the first movie. Because like, whether you think that the first movie is saying that they need more cops like Popeye, or cops like Popeye need to be, like, controlled better, put on a leash or something, that movie definitely does not think that Popeye Doyle is, like, completely flawless and, and heroic. So, you know, yeah, taking him out of his element is essentially the, the only thing that is even remotely interesting to do with this character. And there's a... There's a certain logic to taking him to Marseille. You know, I, I think... A strong argument could be made that it doesn't make a lot of sense that he's the only American cop sent to Marseille. And they, they have a line. They have a line that's supposed to explain it. And I, some critics seem to take it at face value and say, that's ridiculous. I think we're supposed to think that's ridiculous. It must be, you know, he must be joking when he says it, you know, but yeah. Because, you know, yeah, in case you haven't watched the first one, or you're, you know, a little fuzzy on the details, Sean Yee, the drug smuggler, is from Marseille. You know, he returned to Marseille after the events of the first movie. And, yeah, you know, makes a lot of sense that Popeye would, you know cross international borders to stop this guy because he's not the president of the Zhang Yi fan club exactly now yeah so this movie is either about how bad a New York cop is at dealing with Marseille or it's about how bad France is that this hard-working honest New York cop can't deal with it and I fear it's the latter and honestly, just you find yourself wondering why Popeye doesn't buy, or, you know, one of the French cops, one of the Marseille cops, who know about the language barrier, doesn't just get him one of those English to French phrase books. Like, I've been to, to other countries. You know, when when I was a kid, I didn't have a choice. My parents demanded I go along with them on vacations. So I've had those things. You know, they're they're useful. They 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 do a lot to to deal with the language barrier, and like several of the situations he's in. Like I feel like this movie. If I didn't know better. I would think that part of making this movie was to make a short was was to you know it was it was like it was actually a cover it was like it was like that that Argo movie movie you know the the in reality what it's about is filming you know a couple of short scenes with you know big deal actor Gene Hackman you know big deal at the time at least struggling to to figure out you know to to get across the to what do you do with a barrier you you cross it i guess to cross the language barrier because it was actually made by an alien 
who doesn't know that phrase books exist. But, you, you know, obviously that isn't actually it, but, like, it really is. Like, did the screenwriters not know, or do they just think that Popeye wouldn't get one? Because it's just, it's so ridiculous. Like, he'll go to a bar, and, like, he'll he'll be like, uh, get me some Jack Daniels. And the bartender will say, Jack, Jackie? Which I'm almost certain means Jack who? And then, you know, Popeye doesn't really understand, so he says, yeah, Jackie, Jackie Daniels. And it's like, just how... It's, it's... I didn't... I was underage at the time, so I did not, in fact, order liquor. But I would be extremely surprised if none of the phrase books, for English to French, if not a single one of them, just tells you how to order a drink because it's just and it's just yeah like it's it's like watching i mean i guess if you if you yeah it's it's just it's it's baffling seeing him struggle so like he acts like he woke up on a different planet Instead of, like, to get from America to France, dude had to get on a plane. He had to spend hours, like, at some point along the journey, did his brain maybe, like, at least for a second consider the possibility, maybe they don't speak English. Because it's like, I've, I've been to France. You Yeah, some of them speak French, <laughs> English. But, like, you can't expect everyone, everywhere you go, to speak English. You know, the, you gotta, yeah, phrase book or, or memorize a, a little bit. And he just refuses. And, yeah, like I, like I said, I, either it's saying that, you know, Popeye is ridiculous for refusing to, to do just a tiny bit to, to adjust or the you know i mean i'm fairly certain that the fifth die hard movie is about how bad russians are for not all speaking english but i'm not 100% certain if this is on if this sides with the american or the french yeah now fernando ray is the only other rip is the only other actor from the first movie to reprise his role in this and he yet again plays Alain Jeannier and according to IMDb Trivia whenever Fernando Rey is speaking French in the film his voice is dubbed by a French actor and yeah then there is Bernard Fresson RIP as Inspector Henri Barthélemy and yeah you know, I I kind of wish Henri was the protagonist because he's I'm not blowing anybody's mind by saying he's the more likable or appealing. Cause, and I get it. I'm not saying I'm not saying Popeye is supposed to be likable. I get it. That's you know. Like, wasn't there a version of Popeye where, like, Ed O'Neill, who played Al Bundy, was supposed to, you know, he, he yeah, he, he played the role and it didn't really take off. I th was it just called Popeye? Yeah. 1986 TV movie Popeye Doyle, where he plays... Popeye Doyle, and it, it has a 5.7 out of 10 on IMDb. Only 340 people even bothered to vote, so this is not a thing that people, yeah. I don't know, I mean, I guess Al Bundy wasn't quite unlikable enough for Popeye. Popeye does not have very much 
of an arc in this, he doesn't really change very much. Which, again, like, the first movie, you know, it's not, it's not really trying to... You know, it's, it's primarily about showing what these people are like and what this situation is like. But he does, a, like, over the course of the movie, you see him in situations like he, you know, sometimes he fails, sometimes he struggles, and, you know, like... And then you also get to see him, like, near the end of the, the movie, when, you know, Sean Ye can see that he has blocked off the path, he does the, the coy little wave, you know, that Sean Ye did at him earlier. So, you know, and, and just in this, like, I don't, I wouldn't really say that, that Popeye is made all that, like, it's a little interesting to see how he responds with the with the whole language barrier and such, but there's not a lot of what's the word? You know, the, nothing really changes after the um, yeah, and and yeah, ultimately you're just left with yeah, it's just. A lot of the, you know, they find slightly different ways for him to struggle with the language barrier multiple times. And yeah, Henri, you know, he starts out not really liking or trusting Popeye. And, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give away spoilers here, but just, you know, things, he's not a static char character. And, yeah, so the dialogue, like, this is one of those where, I'm going to, I'm going to quote a, a fellow critic on this one. One thing you realize right away is that this film is not going to give you subtitles. You see, as part of the whole experience, you are as much alienated by the language barrier as Doyle is, provided you don't also speak French. It's a neat idea in theory, but can be a bit jarring in practice. And then he says, the film to do this, completely right, Rescue Dawn. I don't know that movie, but yeah, it definitely is. <sighs> yeah. I honestly... I didn't mind, but yeah, it does mean there's only so much of the dialogue that I can even comment on, uh, you know, because I don't speak French and there were no subtitles for it. But yeah, like, the stuff that you you have to understand, where you have to understand the nuances that is spoken in English or someone translates it into English from French. Now, let's see, yeah, so in the IMDb quote section, there are 11 entries, and they're all very representative of the film, so, yeah, for better or worse. And, let's see, right, IMDb trivia says that, according to producer Robert L. Rosen, Pete Hamill's uncredited rewrite of the screenplay took place over three days shortly before filming began, and virtually all dialogue spoken in the movie was written by Hamill. And... Yeah, so quoting a few fellow critics here, while a definite improvement over its very awkward predecessor, thanks in no small part to Moon the Story of France, thank you, the sequel suffers many of the same problems than the original suffered from, namely often interest, uninteresting dialogue. And yes, I know he said something. Yeah, he also said a staggeringly slow pace. Like, I don't know. I've watched other 70s movies. I've watched 
you know, many movies from, you know, decades before I was born. It's just, you just, you get used to it. This is not a slow movie. I, I, I would definitely say, in my personal opinion, ultimately how fast or slow you feel a movie is, is, you know, it is in part a sub subjective and one critic says the dialogue is appalling, nothing like authentic or compelling as the original film. I would definitely say, like, I don't think I'm going to remember any of the dialogue from this movie. And, like, you know, it has now been weeks since I did my video on the first one. Let's see if we can find it real quick. Yeah, the, the other one I did... Oh, wow. Ju yeah, July 30th. So, it's a little bit bad. You know, I, I still remember, you know, Pick Your Feet in Poughkeepsie and, you know, Hackman saying, I, I don't care how many of the, the bartenders have quit. I'm, I'm not tending bar for you. It's it's too cold. Or, you know, whatever. I, I don't remember the 100% verbatim quote, but yeah, like... And this, yeah, yeah, I hadn't even thought about it, but it's true. The the dialogue is very uninspired. It's it's really not particularly compelling in this. And yeah, maybe that's part of, you know, like rewriting an entire script over three days and virtually all of the dialogue was written in those three days. Yeah, I th even if you're an incredibly good writer, that's a lot to... Yeah, I think that might be how, yeah. The cinematography was handled by D.P. Claude Renoir, R.I.P. And I gotta say, a lot of these movies I have never heard of, but he was a cinematographer on 83 movies. So 82 other than this one. And... Yeah, um, a crime and punishment adaption. Very cool. That's an excellent book. If you have a chance, it's worth a read. 1949 Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, I, you know, and, and some of them are just straight up French, you know, and that, yeah, so, so basically... You know, the whole, uh, I guess I shouldn't say, it. most of the movie is shot in France. And they hired a local cinematographer, I guess, which makes sense. So he, you know, he knew how to film Marseille instead of some American guy having to learn it. And definitely, like, the the cinematography is really, really good the let's see yeah i'm gonna quote a couple of fellow critics here it's consistently well filmed the cinematography is excellent throughout flawlessly capturing the flavor of the grimy litter strewn back streets and slums of marseille and frankenheimer retains friedkin's on location shooting methodology Frankenheimer retained some of Friedkin's visual style, the use of zoom lensing and hilt photography, some of the editing moves, but the look of the film is quite different. <clears throat> now, see. yeah, once we're past the opening shot of the Marseille Harbor, which is quite dreadful, gone is that grainy, contrasty documentary appearance, and in its place, a much more routine film. Color is more full blooded film stocks more consistent the camera work has a kinetic like touch capturing the exhausting action with creative pov shots yeah and that is definitely like if you if one of your favorite things about the first movie was the grainy contrast documentary appearance and you know yeah it's it is definitely one of the best aspects of it, it was it was legitimately such an inspired move to film it like that because 
it really just it is such a different movie from the movies that came before it that were you know similar in in you know genre and yeah and yeah the the you know here it is just yeah routine but it is filmed well you know it is again that thing of like if you try i, I try to I try to grade sequels on a curve because it just gets exhausting to talk about how all all the different ways that it's inferior. Yeah, it's inferior, but it is well shot. And the Yeah, you know, and also like if you watched some of the first and were really and really couldn't stand the documentary appearance of yeah, this might be more to your liking. This was edited by Tom Rolf, R.I.P., who edited 44 movies. Let's see. And it's again, I can't, oh, right. Wait, is that, is that the right one? I'm just really quick. Yeah, he edited Equilibrium. Which has excellent editing. So and heat, sneakers. Let's see, is there other stuff I have watched? Taxi driver. Yeah, he he's a very very talented editor, and I don't think it's his fault that there that this movie. It definitely, this movie definitely needs, needed to be trimmed down. I, I really don't think it is, what's the word? I, I don't see any reason for an action movie and one that, like, apparently exists so that we, like, a lot of people were, like, the first movie ends with, you know, after all this hard work they don't get Charnier, you know, and sometimes that does happen, and that is what happened in real life, you know, I, f I forget what the real life version of Charnier was called, but yeah, he, he died in France peacefully without, you know, he wasn't in prison or anything, and yeah, you know, a lot of Americans watched the first movie, and they were like, you can't end the movie without the bad guy getting killed by the good guy. That's not how it works. So they made another movie, and I'm not going to tell you whether or not he succeeds, but that is obviously part of the point of this movie. And then they slow it down with this language barrier stuff, which, like, at the end of the day, you could have just gotten past the language barrier stuff in just a few minutes. Like, I don't... There's this montage of him struggling... And that by itself isn't bad. I think it maybe trim it down a little bit, but after that, like I, I think it would just have been like just have it be that he loses his phrase book early on, you know, and then he has to get another one and he's struggling to, you know that's all that's kind of funny you know he has he he doesn't have the phrase book so he can't tell people that he doesn't have the phrase book and needs to buy a new one you know he goes around a couple of different places and eventually finds the right one and you know the the yeah yeah and and after all this frustration he finally manages to buy one so he he thumbs through it you know trying to find something and you know the the guy who just sold it to him is like what what are you waiting what what are you doing can we move along I have other customers and and you know Doyle is like just just a second here you know I'm 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 looking for the word for this situation and and the the Frenchman understands oh he's you know what what do I say merci you know and and Doyle is like no no, no. and then he finds it um. I don't know. Uh, what is a I don't know swearing in French? Uh, 
yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, maybe he maybe he slightly bungles that, and he just says "to merd," you know, "you you shit," uh, you know, so, something like that. That would you know that would be in character. It would be slightly amusing, and then you move on for the rest of the movie. He uses you know, but instead, like. It just goes on. Again, I'm not going to give away whether the entire movie is like that, but I would definitely say that far too much of the movie is like that. And it's just, I mean, we can only cringe so much at his behavior before it's just like, I mean, in the first movie, his extreme behavior, at least, like you could say, oh, it got results, but here it's not getting results. And like, even Popeye can't possibly think that it would. So you're just wondering, like, can he just not turn it off? Is that what this is? Was the fact that he made it work in New York accidental? Like, he was he was in, you know, tuned in to the, the right frequency there, but anywhere else he goes, is, you know, which I can appreciate, you know, that's that's maybe kind of sad. You know, that's very isolating. If, you know, most of the places you go, you're alone, you know, you can't com c communicate with people. But again, like, is that is this really the right movie for that kind of thing? Like, it's just, yeah, it, it, it doesn't seem to me like this was the right place to, to do that kind of thing. But yeah, if you're just looking at the, the, you know, the editing overall is really great. There's a, there's some stuff that should have been trimmed down, but when you just look, is it called moment to moment editing? I think that's really great. The, um, yeah, I gotta say, I've, I feel like I gotta say. Like in the first movie, the blood looks like watered-down red paint. And it's not as much of a problem in this one. I, but, but yeah, you know, it is still... Yeah. It does have some convincing effects. It's not an effect-heavy movie, but what little there is is convincing, and it has some really great stunt work. Now, yeah, so this had a budget of 4.3 million and the box office was 12 and a half million. And yeah, I, I can see that it, you know, you can tell that they spent money on this thing, that it's not just, you know, five guys and a video camera, you know, they, they yeah. And I think that's right. This was mostly filmed in Marseille. There's a little bit of Paris, but yeah. And that is also something that really does, you know, it doesn't feel like it's just the same one again, which again, just would like... I, I understand wanting more after the first movie, but I think it's important to re recognize that we shouldn't get more of that. You know, they're, like maybe spiritual successors, sure. And, and you know, there are, like, the, the you know, Popeye and Dirty Harry. You know, there are, yeah. You know, even even today, you you can find tough cops that are very much in that vein. But an actual continuation of the story, I don't think was a good idea. But if you're gonna do it, yeah, you know, take take us somewhere else. You know, I I don't think there's any any spot of New York that looked dirty that did not appear in the first movie so yeah no no reason to to yeah 
So the action has stuff like chases on foot and involving vehicles, physical fights, shooting, including shooting at people in vehicles, and let's see. yeah, you know, it's not a super action-heavy movie, but they are, you know, they're filmed well, they're entertaining. Yeah, you know, I'm. I mean, I'm not sure that I would recommend the first movie for action scenes. It's more tension and storytelling. The the way that it keeps like things move really fast, and and the the fact that no one like slows down the movie to just deliver a lot of exposition. You know, you figure things out through context clues, visual storytelling. You know. And the score was handled by Don Ellis, R.I.P., who composed for eight movies in total. And he's actually, he's one of the only people who, you know, yeah, returned for, for this one. He did both of these movies, and... I honestly didn't notice the music that much this time. He did a really great job on the first one. But there, let's see. Okay, so, yeah, I'm going to quote a few fellow critics. The music adds to the atmosphere setting. And the, oh, yeah, over the opening credits, there's some horrendously cheesy 70s soundtrack music. The eerie yet, in retrospect, slightly cheesy original score by Don Ellis provides welcome reminiscence to the original film. Music adds to the atmosphere and style. Yeah, he returns to score the sequel, which is not nearly as radical as his work for the first connection. Not wanting to repeat itself, he reinvents. He invents a pretty good, if occasional, score. Fragments of recognizable French tunes from time to time. For what is, after all, after all, a different movie with a very, in a, yeah, with a different agenda. Now, the movie... The middle chunk of the movie has a bit of a problem. With, you know, as, as far as pacing goes. It's, it's just too slow. The first third is fine. The, the last third is good. Yeah, I think that is all I will say before, without getting into spoilers. So the movie is an hour and 58 minutes long without end credits and 59 and a half minutes long with end credits. And yeah, if you if you watch the first 30 minutes, if you're still interested after that, if you're not interested by that point, I'm not sure the movie's going to do anything to win you over after that. So let's see. That brings the yeah, so this is the section where I'm supposed to get into the best element. I do think that hmm. Yeah, let me think. As far as continuation of the first movie, you know, if you gotta have that, then this, you know, yeah, could be a lot worse. I think that is the, yeah. So the worst aspect, it is nowhere near as gritty as the first one. 
and yeah, you know, worst aspect according to others is that it is an unnecessary sequel. Now, what I was most worried about was that it would misunderstand the appeal of the first one, and yeah, definitely there's some of that going on. What I was most looking forward to was Frankenheimer's direction, and on that, the movie did live up to my expectations. I did think it was, yeah. So the trailer, the trailer does give too much away, and I do think they could have gotten audience interest without spoiling, but it does also give you a pretty good idea of what the movie is like. The cover and posters do not give too much away. And the, the posters and cover give you, like, they do a reasonable job at giving you an idea of what the movie is like. So, I searched YouTube, here on YouTube, for videos on this movie, and I found three clips, the only trailer, no fan ones or anything, three review analysis videos and nothing else and that's I have I've never found so little for a movie that like I mean this has names attached to it you know John Frankenheim, Regine Hackman, Don Ellis and it's a sequel to a highly respected you know um, Gene Hackman won the Oscar for the first one, for, for his performance, so, you know, yeah, the, the fact that so few people even care, even care to say that they hate it, was quite the surprise. On Rotten Tomatoes, this has an 84% on the tomato meter, based on 37 reviews, and a 62 audience score, based on over 5,000 ratings. Now, the critics' consensus is flawed and more conventional than its predecessor. French Connection 2 still offers a wealth of dynamic action and gritty characterizations. And, yeah, so for the 37 reviews, the average rating is 6.70 out of 10. 31 of them are fresh, and only 6 are rotten. And of the over 5,000 ratings by users, the average rating is 3.5 out of 5. So, yeah, it is fresh. And the movie... Wait, is that right? I, let me just double check. Apparently, the movie... Oh, here we go. I forgot to copy it in, is all. Okay, so, yeah, on Metacritic, the movie has a 68 out of 100 based on... Nine critic reviews, six of them positive, three of them mixed, none of them negative. And on uh, the user score is 6.6 .6 out of 10, based on five ratings, two positive, three mixed, and zero negative. And there are only two reviews, and one of them's in French. Yeah. Now, the... That bring, yeah, so that brings us to IMDb. There were only 95 user reviews for this one. Usually, I read the top voted 100. But yeah, and as far as, yeah, so one person gave it a 1 out of 10. One gave it a 2 out of 10. Three gave it a 3 out of 10. Six gave it a 4 out of 10. Nine, 5 out of 10. 14, 6 out of 10, 17, 7 out of 10, 19, 8 out of 10, 8 for 9 out of 10, and 13 for 10 out of 10. So, yeah, there's a, yeah, there are more people, more of the people who voted on those reviews liked the movie than did not. There were only 57 links in the IMDb external review section, and... Interesting. I wrote 39 or 44 of the 57 links. So I guess. Does that mean I didn't update? Okay, so it's one of those. Anyway. 
so yeah, the the movie was nominated for at the BAFTA Awards. Gene Hackman was nominated. Best actor. And let's see. Yeah, he was nominated for the Golden Globe, Best Actor in a Motion Picture Drama. And the Writers Guild of America was nominated for the best drama written directly for the screen. But yeah, it did not win any of them. And it has a 6.7 6 out of 10, based on 18,561 IMDb users. And 34.4% gave it 7, 21.9% gave it 6, 18% gave it 8, 8.4 uh, gave it 5, 5.7 gave it 9, 5.1 gave it 10, and 3.2 gave it 4, and everything else is, yeah, 1.5 or below. So, that is about it for the review. Right, on Disney Plus, this has no special features. And let's see. Right, so yeah. I rate this seven unnecessary sequels out of ten. I'm probably not going to watch this soon. I wouldn't mind watching again at some point. Um, I don't know, maybe a year from now. It's not something that I'm dying to rewatch. And, yeah, the first movie is definitely the better of the two. And that brings us to the thoughts sections. I'm just really quickly going to note the time code. Notes taken while watching. So, from here on out, spoilers for this movie and first. And yeah, like in the first, Shanyi is introduced to being charming in his element. And I do appreciate that the movie does acknowledge that it was corruption on the New York police force that got the real life Shanyi off. And that's what they went with for this movie as well. And. Yeah, through the, <clears throat> let's see, yeah, you know, when, when Shanyi spots Popeye, you can tell from the look on his face, he has come to the sudden devastating realization he is in a sequel to The French Connection, and he knows full well that movie should stand alone. I thought it was kind of ridiculous how, like, Popeye has literally just gotten rid of the tail, and then he's immediately grabbed by Sean Yves' men, like, seconds. And it's also, like, it's one of the only times in the movie that he accomplishes what he sets out to do. So much of the movie, he's, like, trying to communicate, and he fails. So he tries to flirt with a girl, and because of language issues, he fails, you know, and trying to intimidate uh, um, a witness or, you know, criminal and such, he fails because of the language barrier. And, you know, but he does manage to lose the tail and he's grabbed him immediately. So, yeah, it is like the movie is saying that he, he should basically just go home and leave the police work to the real... Uh, you know, yeah, but but then by the end of the movie, he is the one who manages, you know, it's his cop instincts that make sure that they, you know, they reach Sean Yee and he's able to shoot him, so, yeah. So 40 minutes into the movie, Popeye is caught, forced to be an addict, 51 minutes in, he's released, Detox begins, and Detox is done 75 minutes in, so that is 24 agonizing minutes of detox and 
35 minutes of movie devoted to him being an addict. So, so yeah, you know, the middle third of the movie is, yeah, and 80 minutes in, he's back to feeling good. So, yeah, the middle 40 minutes of this two-hour movie is just him dealing with this, yeah. And especially, like, there's no reason for the movie to go on for as long as it does after that. Because it's like, okay, we get it. Move on. Move on dot org. Let's let's finish this thing. And as others have pointed out, the whole detox thing is in part a way for Hackman to try to earn another Oscar. And you know, they're in the car and Popeye is like, ah, oh, I could use me some of that. A woman right now would finish you off. No no. Henri, can we stop for ice cream? Sure. Bring some water. A lot of it. I mean, we already knew he was thirsty. And as cathartic as it is burning the building down, I guess he's fine with the possibility of this slow-moving old lady dying in the fire. And 86 minutes in, the two cops approach the ship. And we have a shootout from, you know, 88 minutes to 93 minutes. Yeah, I, I will say at least the last third does move fairly quickly. It is very smart of the bad guys to use water against the two cops. While it's true that neither of them are fire types, they do clearly have plot armor. No need to waste bullets on them. Henri asks, you know, on behalf of the, the other cop, you know, Hand in the passport, stay in the hotel, which is, of course, the international version of his chief demanding his badge and gun. And 98 minutes in, suddenly Popeye's instincts work out, like in the first film. He knows that Shonyi hasn't paid the, the guy with the ship, but will. And we get, I, I didn't notice exactly, four to six minutes of them on stakeout, waiting for the other side to make a move, something the first had a lot of. So it almost kind of feels like, you know, oh. This is what this is what you want out of the French Connection movie, right? Stakeouts. And 109 minutes in the film, the the you know 109 minutes into an into a 118 minute movie, the climax begins, and we get some shootout. Popeye on foot, chasing Chanier, who uses a trolley and a boat. And the movie smash cuts to end credits right after Chanier is shot to death. I suppose it depends on the viewer whether that is a misunderstanding of why the ending of the first movie is so effective. If it's like an attempt to remedy it or what. And where the first movie also had a text segment explaining what happens to various people, this one I guess we're supposed to ignore the fact that what Popeye did, you know, though we might think it was the right thing to do, is very illegal and he would probably get into a lot of trouble for it, but... You know, that is the cowboy archetype for you. And yeah, for sure, like some people, I'm certain they watched this movie and they were like, thank you, that's all I wanted from the first one. Just have him shoot Charny so we can, you know, that's, yeah. And, you know, I said when I was in the review, I, in the review section, I said that the movie could, like, what a lot of people wanted out of it could have been a short film. You know, if, if, the first movie was an MCU movie. You know, this would basically have been the 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 one shot that shows that after that happened, there was this, you know. And, yeah, I, I think that would have been fine. I don't think we needed an entire movie. I feel bad for Frankenheim. We're having to you know, handle someone else's, uh, you know, s someone had to direct it. I, I don't know. I, I mean, maybe he wanted to. I am not 100% sure. And that brings us to the final section. Notes taken before watching. And...
Right, I just wanted to briefly note, according to IMDb trivia, in planning the climactic chase in which Doyle pursues Shonye across the Mosley, director John Frankenheimer wasn't aware that Gene Hackman suffered from knee problems. Despite this, Hackman went ahead and filmed the entire chase without a double, badly inflaming his knee by the time he was through. He has said that Doyle's expressions of pain and determination as the chase progressed didn't require much action. Ouch. Yeah, that's a... Uh, That's determination. Now, the let's Yeah, so one of the reasons that, you know, the yeah, so the real, the guy that Shonyi was based on, Jean Jahan, uh, you know, he went back to France and the, let's see, yeah, Jahan had fought alongside French President Charles, Charles de Gaulle. De Gaulle, during the French Resistance in World War II, was considered a war hero with many connections. Now, you might know this if you watch this movie, that these things are simply never brought up in this movie. Obviously, when you make a movie based on real events, you don't have to bring up every single detail. However, I would argue that the reason that this is not in this movie is that a lot of American conservatives watching the movie might stop and think about how many American criminals are given light sentences or not punished at all simply because they have connections or, you know, or perceived a hero for something they did. Instead, this movie wants to pat the American, average American moviegoer on the head and reassure them that a tough American cop can solve any crime problem. Now, let's see. Yeah, so the... Um, yeah. One of my fellow critics asked some questions and I would like to briefly answer them. After Hackman was captured by the bad guys, what exactly was the point of them spending a lot of time turning him into a drug addict and then dumping him back for the local police to look after? Why was such a pointless extra long time spent on showing his cold turkey cure and his sports fantasies? Was this cure meant to last for three weeks or more? What was the point of showing an old woman who has nothing to do with the story stealing his wristwatch? Were all the people in the whole hotel Tangier or Kalnad drug addicts? The answer to all, war on drugs, fear mongering. Now, the... Yeah, you know, Shonye captures Popeye, injects him with a lot of heroin, hoping to break his will. There are scenes of his body rejecting it and coping. I mean, I guess that was the only place to go for the whole war on drugs movie without getting repetitive. The first movie is about how awful, uh, let's see, how you how about how you have to be hard on people who use drugs. So this one is about how awful it is to be on drugs. So a number of people say that this movie, should, actually, yeah, let me just briefly. So the. Uh, let's see. I think there was some. Hmm. Yeah, and you know, yeah, various uh, people online have uh, you know asked. Why does Shonye not kill Popeye? But that would, he, you know, every 
cop in France would be after him J just because they didn't like him. They're still like it's you know they they really stick together. So yeah, it is. and and Sean Yi is very careful and strategic. He never really does something that's just completely out of like. For sure, it would have made a lot of sense for him to have his men like cover Popeye's face before they drag him into the hotel. Failing that, you know. Actually, wait, did they get everyone out of the hotel that was that had to do with drugs? I'm not sure any of them were left for Popeye to deal with. And anyway, but yeah, that's why the they didn't kill him. Let's see. Yeah, so a number of people say this movie is inferior to the first. I think it's worth noting that part of the reason this even exists is that a lot of people were unsatisfied with the ending of the first one, where, like in real life, ultimately these American cops are not able to kill or arrest this French drug smuggler. You know, this entire movie exists in part to satisfy an audience that was frustrated with having their expectations subverted by a movie that was based on a true story, telling them the unpleasant truths that even when cops know who is guilty and break rules in order to stop the guilty person, they won't always be able to stop the guilty person. And rather than applaud police brutality, the first film wants us to reflect on it, particularly considering that sometimes it doesn't even lead to results, which is, you know, that's the, the excuse people always give, you know, no, no, yeah, okay, police brutality, but it gets results. What about when it doesn't? And a lot of audiences and some critics were not willing to even consider that. There's a reason why that this movie ends immediately after Popeye shoots Shonye. After two entire movies of teasing that happening, it delivers that. And at that point, why even keep the movie going? Honestly, if when this movie... Yeah. The, the thing about short films... Yeah. I think there's some chance that, you know, if when this movie came out, short films were tenable to put in cinemas, I think there's some chance that this movie would literally have just been a foot, you know, the foot chase at the end culminating in shooting Fernando Ray. You know, just briefly have the, the movie start with, let's see, yeah, he arrives in Marseille and, yeah, the, the you know, the, the French cop tells him where... Shanyi is, and, you know, I don't know, for some reason he can't go with, or maybe he goes with and shoots other people, like, in the movie, but, yeah. And that is everything that I had. So, please go into the comment section and let me know what is your favorite movie that is like this, or do you think that, you know, do you have ideas for how this could have been a better sequel? Or do you just not think that the first should have had a sequel? Yeah. And if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. One or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put up one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on the movie, and one talking about my spoiler food thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show, which these days is She-Hulk. And recently, the reviewing thoughts videos tend to be very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time.